I think all of us would agree that we live in a nation that is divided, that uh, as we look at the history of our nation, I think up into the period of the 90s, there was a healthy respect for the Christian values, the foundations upon which our nation was built. But over the last 20 years, we've seen, uh, particularly through elections, national elections that have taken place and just what's happening in uh, in Washington, how uh, our, 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 our nation is more and more divided. And, and the chasm in the last couple of years seems to be so much wider and so much deeper. And uh, the scholars tell us that really our nation is divided pretty much 50-50 on uh, those issues that are liberal, more progressive, and those that are more conservative. And I think one of the telling signs of that is a recent decision by a federal district court here in Missouri concerning the College of the Ozarks. It is a great Christian school. Uh, It's over near Branson. If you've never been there, you need to go visit College of the Ozarks. Our family, we've been there several times. uh, And what drew us there was the great dinners they serve at that university. Uh, The students work for their tuition. They all have jobs. And, of course, there are others who help support the the college. And I'm very impressed with its foundation, with its leadership, what they're uh, instilling uh, these students, a biblical worldview. But they were proactive and filed a lawsuit against the current administration uh, about allowing transgenders to use bathrooms and uh, also to allow those students in dorms. And uh, I won't get into all the details of that, as you would understand. Uh, and they, uh, that uh, ruling went against the college. And so now they're going to appeal that. But, you know, 20 years ago, we would have never considered this. It, 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 just, it, it just would not have happened. But now we see that there is more and more and more a divide. It, it's as if our nation is breaking into pieces. And it's discouraging, and it's hard to understand what is happening. But also on a personal level, we find times that we feel that maybe our lives uh, are in pain and brokenness, the suffering, and uh, we we don't know how to handle that. We don't understand what God is doing. Uh, Why is this happening? It's a natural question that we ask. Uh, I, I think with all of these things that are happening, and I think particularly with our nation, questions like, uh, is, is the world coming to an end? Is this the birth pains of, of uh, the judgment of God on our nation? Uh, you know, why is there this suffering that is taking place uh, in our world and in our own lives personally? And natural questions that we would ask. And, and I think that the series is very important because a lot of people have a problem taking the next step in their spiritual life because they've not adequately dealt with their past. You know, often I'll have people come into my office and they will say, Pastor, I don't know why I say the things that I do. I don't know why I do the things that I do. I don't know why this, this, this uh, bad habit or the way that I respond keeps happening. And I, I, I don't know, you know how to control that. I don't know what's going on. And oftentimes, it it leads back to a point of brokenness in their life, and they've not dealt with that. Uh, They don't know how to respond to that. Now, uh, also, I find that people will describe how hard it is at times to allow people to get close to them. You know, they want to have relationships, and even in marriages, they'll allow that person to get close to them to a certain point, and then all of a sudden, a wall goes up. And they're not going to let them come in any further than that. And usually that's a sign that something is going on. There's something that's not been adequately dealt with where I can be open with someone. And that doesn't mean that I'm allowing everybody into the innermost parts of my life. But in the significant relationships that we have, we ought to be healthy enough emotionally and spiritually where there's transparency in those relationships. And uh, somebody will say, well, how do I know that I've been healed from times of pain? Let me stop and say, too, you know, when you go through grief, there's a period of time, usually about a year, where, uh, you know, the emotions are high. And uh, it's normal. 
And there are going to be times that that grief is just overwhelming you. But, and there are ways to control that grief. Allow it, but control it in a way that is healthy. But, but I'll tell people, I'll say, look, you know, when you had the experience, uh, maybe it was a season of life or a moment, that it was very painful uh, in that moment. It was hard for you to control your emotions. Uh, you didn't know how you were going to get through that. But you know you're healed for the most part when one day you see a freckle on the elbow and it represents that event and there's no pain associated with it. You, you realize it happened, it was a bad thing, but you don't feel all those emotions that you did at that time. And of course it's a process. And so today I want us to begin with with Paul's example of how he dealt with the time of brokenness in his life, dealing with pain in his life so that it was redemptive and he learned some great lessons from God that will encourage us today and allow us to encourage others. So I want you to open your Bibles to 2 Corinthians chapter 12 and it's uh, probably one of the classic examples of, of uh, Paul expressing himself through this period of brokenness. And what we're going to see is that God's grace works in times of brokenness. We don't work for God's grace. God's grace works for us. And we're going to learn how that grace works for us specifically in times of brokenness. So let me begin in chapter 12, verse 1, uh, where Paul writes to the church at Corinth, It is necessary to boast. It is not helpful. But I will move on to visions and revelations of the Lord. I know a man in Christ who was caught up into the third heaven 14 years ago. Whether he was in the body or out of the body, I don't know. God knows. I mean, was it my spirit that was in the third heaven or was it my entire body, my being into heaven? He said, I don't know. God knows. I know that this man, whether in the body or out of the body, I do not know. God knows was caught up into paradise. He heard inexpressible words which a man is not allowed to speak. I will boast about this person, but not about myself, except of my weaknesses. For if I want to boast, I will not be a fool, because I will be telling the truth. But I will spare you so that no one can credit me with something beyond what he sees in me or hears from me, especially because of the extraordinary revelations." Therefore, so that I would not exalt myself, a thorn in the flesh was given to me, a messenger of Satan to torment me, so I would not exalt myself. Concerning this, I pleaded with the Lord three times to take it away from me. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for power is perfected in weakness. Therefore, I will most gladly boast all the more about my weaknesses, so that Christ's power may reside in me. So because of Christ, I am pleased in weaknesses, in insults, in catastrophes, in persecutions, and in pressures. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Now, a great passage of Scripture and a few things that I want us to learn about the way in which God's grace works for us in times of bitterness. Number one, notice the grace of blessing, the grace of blessing. The blessing is of the revelation that he received of how God helped him understand what was going on in his life. And so he explains what that is. Now he starts by saying that if I want to boast, I could boast and I could boast about uh, revelations that I've had and visions that I've had. Now, what is that about? Well, again, context is everything interpreting the scripture. And just prior to this, Paul is talking about the false teachers and in essence, what they were doing is they were coming to the churches at, or the church at Corinth and they were sharing their visions. And they're saying, this is what the vision that God had given me. And it was like they were one-upping each other, trying to draw the Corinthians away from the gospel and away from Paul uh, and to elevate themselves. Now, Paul, in essence, says... Hey, if anybody can boast, I can boast. There's a lot that God has done in my life. I'm well qualified to be an apostle of the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, I've had these visions. But the boasting that he is going to share about the vision that he has is far different and has a totally different motive by what these false teachers were sharing. Now, what about the vision that he is talking about, this revelation? Well, it's uh, a revelation that... 
uh, Paul had had, and he had several before. He had one on the Damascus Road when he saw the Lord Jesus Christ, the risen Christ, and there he had his conversion experience, became a follower of Christ. He had a vision of Ananias coming to him. He had a vision of being called to the Gentiles, another vision when God called him to Macedonia, and several times he had visions where God encouraged him through these visions. Now, in verse 2, he says that this vision, this specific one, came to him 14 years ago. He means 14 years before writing this uh, letter to the church at Corinth, which would have been about 43 A.D., just a few years after the resurrection of Christ. Now, notice he says in verse 2, I know a man. He uses the third person uh, pronoun there. Uh, He's not pointing uh, uh, attention to himself. He's trying to deflect any attention to himself, though he's talking about himself. I know a man, well, he's referring to himself. And uh, this vision was not something that he sought, but it was something that God gave him. Now, here's the point. Paul is going to show them that the vision that he gave was so he, that he could boast about the fact that, that what happened in his life allowed him to... to uh, 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 to uh, relate, that's the word, I'm sorry, relate himself to those in his audience, to those at Corinth. He wasn't sharing a vision that would elevate him above everybody else, but would bring him down to where men lived. And he would, it would allow him to communicate the, the, how God helped him deal with the suffering in his life as they experienced the suffering in his life. It's not about... Uh, him, it's about God's grace. Now, notice in verse 2, he, he says, I was caught up into the third heaven. And in verse 4, he was caught up into paradise. It's the same place. Now, the Jews saw the universe in three levels. And th- in their words, there were the clouds, there were the planets, and there was God's glory, uh, which we would describe as heaven. You know, a person dies and goes to glory, they go to heaven. And Paul says that I was caught up into heaven. I was with the Lord when this vision came to him. And he was blessed by the grace that God had showed him in this vision. That what was going to, uh, he, he would learn from the vision itself of how to deal with his suffering. So everything that had happened in his life was because of God's blessing, the grace that he received. Specifically about what though? Notice secondly, the grace of suffering. In verse 7 he said, Therefore, so that I would not exalt myself, I have this vision, and I could go around boasting about this vision that, and other visions that God has given me, but God did something so that it would deal with my pride. I would not exalt myself, a thorn in the flesh was given to me, a messenger of Satan to torment me, so I would not exalt myself. Notice twice there, he's saying, this is not to exalt me, it's to humble me. Now, what was the thorn in the flesh? Well, the word thorn, it's the only time this word is used in the New Testament. It could mean a literal thorn, or it could mean uh, a stake, or a, 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 a piece of wood that was used to torment someone. And so what he's describing is something that is very painful. He says that this thorn was in his flesh. That means that it was something that affected him physically. He could have described something that was emotional or something that was spiritual. But sometimes that comes later after physical pain, physical suffering, the circumstance that may happen, a physical circumstance. And so it's something that was physical. Many believe, there are different debates about this, but many believe that it was his eyesight that was his thorn. In Galatians, twice he makes reference to his eyesight. He talks about... Uh, how he has to have others who help him, about how large the letters are that he's writing. We're not sure if it's that or something else, but it was something that was very physical in his nature. Now, why did he not be specific about that? More, really, more important, why was God not specific about that thorn in his flesh? I think it's to help us identify with Paul. You know, if he'd have said this was the problem, then we could say, okay, God can help me with that problem, but what about this problem I have that's different? You know, is God still going to be able to help me? And I think God kept it ambiguous so that we can relate to Paul and know that whatever thorn it is that we're experiencing, 
whatever pain, whatever suffering, brokenness it is, that God is able to help us in that moment. Now, we look at uh, people sometimes and we say other Christians, well, you know, they've got their life all together and, uh, you know, they've not experienced the pain and suffering of life. So it's easy for them to talk about spiritual things. Uh, and, uh, and we can't identify or they can't identify with us in our suffering. Uh, sometimes we see that with spiritual giants. And I'll just mention one, John Calvin. One writer says this about John Calvin's health. His afflictions read like a medical journal. He suffered from painful stomach cramps, intestinal influenza, and recurring migraine headaches. He was subject to a persistent onslaught of fevers that would often lay him up for weeks at a time. He experienced problems with his trachea in addition to pleurisy, gout, and colic. He suffered from severe arthritis and acute pain in his knees, calves, and feet. Other maladies included nephritis, gallstones, and kidney stones. He contracted pulmonary tuberculosis at 51, which led ultimately to his death. His health problems were aggravated by his demanding pace of preaching. Now, we would say that John Calvin was one of the greatest theologians the world has ever known. But in spite of all the physical problems that he had, God was able to give him the grace that he needed in his suffering and will do the same for us. Notice he says that this thorn in the flesh was given to me. Somebody else gave this to me. Well, who gave it to him? Well, it was God who gave it to him. And why was it given to him? Well, Paul says it was to humble me. It was to prevent me from being prideful. And this allowed Paul to deal with others, as he says in chapter 10, with the gentleness and graciousness of Christ rather than arrogance. Then he says it was a messenger of Satan. Now, what does that mean? Well, we believe that the Bible teaches that God is a sovereign God, that God is in control of all things, uh, and that uh, if, if it was one split second that he was not in control, everything would fall apart. As Paul says, that all things are held together in Christ. And so we struggle with the times of suffering and, and what is happening. Well, as we learn from the book of Job, that God allows suffering and God permits it. And nothing happens to a Christian of which God allows or does not allow. He, he gives permission to it. Now, that's good news, bad news, because we can say, well, if God is a loving and good God, he could have stopped this from happening, but he didn't, and that's right. And Paul learned there was a reason for his suffering and a reason for your suffering, something that God will use. He allows Satan to test us, and, to, and Satan is the testing agent of God who comes to us. Now, Satan, again, can't work against a believer without the permission of God. And notice that this is something that tormented him. It's the present tense. It was continual. It, uh, this word describes something that is abusive to him. It is violent against him. It was extremely challenging in Paul's life, something that he lived probably with most of his life. So verse 8, he says, concerning this, I pleaded with the Lord three times to take it away. Now, Paul may have thought that this thorn was going to hinder God's work in his life. It'd be a natural prayer. Was it wrong for Paul to pray, God, take this away? Well, I believe that Paul had in mind the scene of Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane, where how many times? Three times. He prayed, God, if there's any way for this cup to pass, meaning the cross, this cup of suffering, let it be. And so the Lord prayed that. And if the Lord prayed that, Paul knew he could pray that, and it teaches that all of us can pray that. Of course, we don't want times of suffering in our life. We want it to be removed. But we come to that point where we see, and Paul had to come to terms with reality. There was no quick fix miracle. Can God heal? Can God do miracles instantly? Of course he can, and I still believe that he can. But he realized in his situation, and there are some who are in situations that will not change. And the sooner we come to terms with that, the greater and sooner the victory will be for us. And that's what he's saying here. So we find that Paul realizes that God is going to answer this prayer, but it's going to be different than what I expected. And this is a very important point to learn right here. 
God not only ordains his promises, but he also ordains the means by which he fulfills those promises. Why does it have to be this way that God does it? Well, I don't know, but God has ordained that. Sometimes we think that, you know, it ought to be this way and not this way. But I think what will really help you is help me to know that the promise of God is that he's going to answer my prayer. He not only hears it, the Bible says, but he answers our prayer. So that's the promise that God has ordained. And the way in which it's answered is ordained by him as well. Therefore, I can trust him. I can rest in him in the way in which he does that. Now, this raises two questions. Why am I experiencing this suffering? It's the same question that's been asked for thousands of years. God is a good God. If he's a loving God, why is there suffering? And it's a question that Christians ask, atheists will ask. Uh, they don't, it doesn't make sense. Well, there are several reasons. Number one, it's because of our own sin, that we're facing the consequences of choices that we made in life. God's forgiven us of those choices. But uh, we're facing those consequences, some of those unintended. We didn't realize it would have this effect on us years later down the road, but they do. And so we, we are forgiven, and we thank God for that, but we realize this is part of, of what's happened. I can't control the consequences. Or we live in a fallen world. This is why we are suffering. Sin has entered the world. That means disease, death, corruption, all the rest, evil has come into the world and so we live in a fallen world. Also, we're victim of circumstances. I, I didn't do anything wrong, but something wrong happened to me. And so that may be the reason why you're suffering. It's not because of sin. Maybe you've been told it's because of sin. And, uh, and you need to ask the Lord, is this a result of sin in my life? And most of the time, it's probably no. It's just something that you're going through, something you couldn't control. It may be God's will. It simply may be that this is what God, and we ultimately know it is his will because he's allowed it to happen. Well, how do I respond to the suffering? Well, how did Paul respond? Well, we're going to learn in just a moment. But notice, you can, you can de deny it. You can say it didn't happen. Uh, you can keep stuffing it down, stuffing it down. But if you do that, one day it's going to blow up. It's going to come out. It could be, be you could blame God. You could blame other people. Uh, you can say it's not my fault. Again, another form of denial. Uh, that's only going to lead to frustration because you've not brought any resolution to what's happened. Uh, you, can, you can respond by being bitter. You can just let it control your life. A bitter person has allowed the brokenness and pain to control their lives. Is it really worth that? Your whole life is defined and controlled. The reason for your existence and the, what you do now is based on what happened a long time ago. Think of all the years that have been wasted. That God could have used you for his glory and for his purpose. You could experience healing much sooner in your life. But chose to be defined and controlled. That's all that bitterness is. When you say, I will not forgive that person for what they have done. Then what you said is that that's going to define my life. That will control me. And that's a horrible place to live. It could, you could say, I'm just going to quit. I'm going to give up. You know, God's failed me. Then I'm out. And a very, very common experience. Uh, you know, in recent days, there have been mu Christian musicians, Christian pastors, who all of a sudden have decided that they're no longer following the faith because of either pain or because of what they believe. For some, they've justified their sin by saying that this is not real. Even strong Christian leaders, they're, they're justifying their lifestyle, saying that it's not real. They just want to live the life they want to live rather than submit to God's will. A person can endure, kind of have that stoic perseverance, but all that is is you trying to have that strength in the flesh. It's, you, it's up to you to make it happen and get through it. Or you can come to a point of acceptance, that this is a gift of grace that God has given you. And that's what Paul learned. The grace 
of suffering strengthened Paul. Well, how did it happen? Well, the third point, the grace of transformation. Notice verse 9. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for power is perfected in weakness. Now, what does that mean? Well, first of all, God's grace is sufficient. It's, it's never lacking. That whatever it is you're going through or you went through, that God is able to bring healing to your life. God is able to handle it. His grace is sufficient. If his grace is sufficient to save you, that means you were dead and you came alive. If he can do that, he can take care of any other problem in your life. If he, if he raised you up from a person who was dead in sin, and now you have life, a spiritual life, he can handle any problem. It's enough. God's grace, he says, is powerful. It will strengthen you. God allows us to become weak. Why? So that we can become strong. He will give you the strength that you need. God's grace is perfecting. The power of grace is made perfect in my weakness. It's a continual process of maturing, being complete. Notice, again, that's present tense. It's going to continue each and every day, each and every moment. He's going to continue to work his will in my life. And then God's grace is transformational. Now, here's the key to it all, verse 9. Therefore, in light of what God told him, I will most gladly boast all the more about my weaknesses so that Christ's power may reside in me. So because of Christ, I am pleased in weaknesses and in insults in catastrophes, in persecutions, and in pressure. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Where was the victory for Christ? Was it on the cross? No, it was in the garden. Not my will, but your will be done. And you need to circle this word, therefore, in verse 9. That's the key to Paul's victory. When he finally yielded his suffering to the Lord Jesus. If all of this is true... Therefore, I'm going to gladly boast about my weakness because I know that God is going to help me. You see, we often pray for substitution, not transformation. God, get me out of this. God, stop this. Please remove this. Again, it's not, it's not wrong to start there. But you've got to come to the point of saying, but therefore, if you're going to allow me to go through it, then I know that your power and your grace is going to be sufficient. You see, acceptance opens the door for that transformation to happen, for that victory to happen. And notice Paul's attitude is also transformed. He says, gladly, I will boast about my weaknesses. I am pleased in all these problems that I have. You know, that's not fairy tale stuff. Am I happy about it? No. No one's happy about going through suffering. But I'm pleased that God is at work in my life and that he is going to come through somehow, some way. Again, the means is just as ordained as the promise and God is going to make it happen. So Paul's limitations, his weaknesses, did not stop the advancement of the gospel. You know, a lot of us think that these problems that we have are holding us back from what God wants to do. If God wants to do something, he's going to do it regardless of the circumstances, regardless of the problem that you face, regardless of your weaknesses. And see, that's where the, that's where the blessing is. The grace is knowing that in spite of all this, God is still doing this in my life and for the sake of the gospel. So the glory goes to him. Paul says, you want me to boast? I can boast. You're boasting about you. I'm going to boast about him. That when I, in my weakest moments, didn't know if I could go another day, God came through. And God allowed me to bring the gospel to you. And God continued to use Paul in a tremendous way. Now, what are the lessons? What are the takeaways today? What are the steps that we need to take? Maybe you're at a point, okay, what do I do? Number one, admit your weakness. 
stop denying not only that it happened, but the effect that it's having on your life. Stop denying that. Accept it and realizing that, hey, this has happened, and I know that. Surrender it to God. Not just admit it, but give it to the Lord. Get to that point of therefore. All right, Lord, this is what you said in your word is true. This is my experience, and I've tried, and it's not working, so I give it to you. I surrender it to you. Third, accept God's grace as sufficient. Allow his grace to become operative in your life and stand on that truth. Number four, live in the power of that grace. That means move on. Don't let it hold you back. But start taking steps forward that God wants you to make. And then finally, praise him for his faithfulness. That's what Paul did. Therefore, I will glory in my affirmity that the power of Christ may dwell within me. Because you see, people know what's going on in your life. They've seen the brokenness. They've, they've, they have heard the pain. They have felt the pain. <clears throat> no, you didn't talk about it. But they know something's not right. But then they see God work in your life. And they see him, which brings glory to him. Would you bow your head and close your eyes? Father, I pray now that you'll help these who need to make commitments to you. Help us to be willing to admit and to surrender and to live in the power of your grace. Father, you know where that place is in their life. And I pray you'll help them now. Others, Lord, you're leading to make a commitment to Christ as their Lord and Savior. <clears throat> They've never surrendered themselves to you and to experience the power of that you want to give them it's not available to them they can't tap into it they can't experience it until they know you so I pray you'll help them come to you there are others Lord that you're leading to become part of our church family Lord I pray they'll come as you lead them others who need to pray quietly here at the altar others who need someone to pray for them Lord, I pray you'll help these who need to make commitments now. In Jesus' name, amen. Ms. Quiley, stand.